Okay, so um, let's get started. Um, so hello everyone. So um, um, welcome to this time's AMU Zoom seminar. Um, uh, it's, uh, we have a treat today um, and then it's really my uh, great pleasure to welcome uh, our today's speaker, Dr. Steve uh, Ziegler from Seattle. So uh, a very, very brief introduction uh, uh, about Steve. So Steve currently is director also the academic affairs in uh, Ben OER Research Institute in Seattle. So uh, Steve uh, completed his um, uh, undergrad study in uh, microbiology in University of Michigan. And then afterwards he pursued his uh, uh, PhD training in UCLA in molecular biology. So after that, uh, Steve um, um, uh, moved on to uh, uh, his postdoc training in uh, two different labs uh, in University of Washington in Seattle, um, uh, both in uh, uh, Department of Microbiology and Immunology. So in the, in the uh, uh, relatively <clears throat> um, um, short uh, postdoc training, Steve actually uh, spent some time in the industry and afterwards, uh, um, around 1997, he actually started his uh, uh, independent lab, uh, become associate member in uh, Benner uh, Research Institute in Seattle. Uh, and then from 2003, he became a full member uh, in the Benner Research Institute. And also same time, uh, become a director uh, in immunology program in Benner uh, Research Institute. Um, also, at the same time, uh, Steve is affiliated uh, professor in a department of immunology in University of Washington, Seattle. So um, the, the main interest in Steve's lab <clears throat> uh, has been focusing on the role of TSLP, which we are probably going to hear a lot today, uh, and how this um, uh, uh, protein in regulating uh, barrier immunity uh, actually, Steve focused on this uh, or studied this um, uh, uh, molecule for a really long time. So um, Steve's lab actually has shown that TSLP is a key initiator of uh, topical responses, including allergy, uh, dermatitis, and asthma. They recently discovered a new role of TSLP as a, um, a important, regulate, re, important regulatory um, of germinal center formation and function. Uh, these studies really actually uh, give a lot of insight on the role of TSLP in regulating immune responses, also, in this, uh, also TSLP also appears to control the production of Ig in both uh, a mouse study and human, demonstrating its uh, critical role for uh, in the in the uh, allergic uh, responses. So, Steve, uh, over these years, his lab really contributed a lot of uh, uh, groundbreaking uh, discovery to the scientific community, which including uh, his lab identified and characterized the FOP3 in regulatory uh, T cells. Uh, he also, his lab also discovered a novel uh, FOP3 isoform in human uh, T-Rex, as well a novel uh, a protein that interact with human, uh, but not mouse uh, FOP3 protein. And furthermore, uh, his lab uh, obviously characterized the Cymex stromer uh, uh, lymphoprotein receptor, which is TSLP receptor and its uh, signal pathway, and also discovered TSLP as the underlying uh, causative uh, factor in the atopical disease and the novel role of TSLP uh, signaling breast and colon cancer. So I think uh, in, at the last, I want to just emphasize, um, uh, it's really, really amazing that uh, Steve's lab actually training a lot of outstanding uh, trainees, uh, including PhD students and postdoc. His lab actually uh, trained over, uh, I think, uh, 30, 35 um, uh, trainees, and uh, most of them actually doing uh, super great in both industry and the, um, in the academia. Uh, so without further ado, we are very much looking forward to your talk, Steve. Thank you so much for uh, joining us today, and then uh, please go ahead. Thanks, Ron, for that really lovely introduction. Now, you know, now that you've given my talk, we can just go straight to the questions. <laughs> So as as Tron said, what I what I want to do today is give an overview initially of this cytokine that I've been chasing around since the early 1990s uh, called TSLP, which is of course the worst named cytokine there is. It stands for thymic stromal lymphopoietin, and it actually was called that by Andy Farr, who discovered it at the University of Washington in the early 1990s, because um, he found it in a thymic stromal cell line. 
And it turns out that Andy thought it was going to be the secret to thymus height development. And it turned out not to have anything to do with the thymus. Um, so we started studying it. And what I'm going to tell you about today is two new stories that just recently were, were published and um, give you an idea of the breadth of the biology of, of, of this cytokine. So I thought I would start with a bit of an introduction. Um, come on. It's not advancing. Okay, let me see what I can do. There we go. So let me get my pointer. Um, TSLP, it's expressed primarily by epithelial cells at barrier surfaces, so the skin, the gut, and the lung. But as you'll see, it, it can be uh, produced by a wide variety of, of cell types, especially at sites of of inflammation. The primary target was initially identified as 11C positive dendritic cells, um, but we now know that lots of other cell types can, can also respond. I, I listed some here. Uh, basically, every hematopoietic cell type expresses the receptor. They don't all respond, and as you'll see in a moment, it's because they may not at least constitutively it expressed the other chain of the TSOP receptor, which is the IL-7 receptor alpha chain. But most uh, hematopoietic cells can respond to the cytokine. And the sort of seminal observation that was made by Young Jun Liu's lab in the early 2000s was showing that the expression of, of TSLP in lesional skin from patients with atopic dermatitis was screamingly high. Um, Whereas uninvolved skin and skin from healthy individuals had basically very low levels of, of expression. And this was the first sort of piece of data that suggested TSLP was associated with, with type 2 or, a, or atopic disease. We now know that it's also expressed in, in the lungs of asthmatics and in the noses of people with allergic rhinitis. And it's it's been a sort of blessing and curse for us that people tend to associate TSLP with, with type two inflammation. And that sort of pigeonholed it in that category for a couple of decades now. Um, whereas at, as you'll see in a moment, TSLP is broadly functional within, within the immune system. And I think it's not necessarily tied to type two inflammation, but it is certainly associated with it. And, and as I mentioned, the, Receptor is a is a co is is a, a heterodimer of the TSOP receptor, which is the cytokine binding chain, and the IL seven receptor alpha chain. When they bind the cytokine in a high affinity state, you activate Jack one and Jack two, and that activates Stat five. And right now, that's really the only signaling pathway we've ever found associated with um, the the um, TSOP receptor signaling pathway. And as I mentioned before, this is the data from, from Young Jun's lab in, in 2002, showing the level of expression by uh, immunohistochemistry on the left side, uh, normal skin where you can bar barely detect any, any staining in the epidermis. And on the right side, uh, skin from a, a lesional skin from an atopic dermatitis patient showing massively elevated levels of, of TSLP expression. And, and so this is sort of what kicked off the field um, for, we, you know, ran with this for about 15 years, generating mouse models that uh, we could use to study the role of, of TSLP in the lung and in the skin and could build models of, as, of asthma and airway inflammation and atopic dermatitis. But what I'm, and this sort of data sort of uh, culminated late last year with the approval of an antibody called tezepelumab um, for patients with severe asthma. And this was the paper that um, gave the data from the phase three clinical trial, which was called Navigator. And this is the actual drug. I don't know where they come up with these names, but they decided to call it Tezpire. Um, I have no idea. Um, but it does work. It works really well. And it's actually, I was told by several pulmonologists that I know who are using this, that it is the strongest monotherapy to treat um, uh, non-T2 or neutrophilic asthma that's uh, other than um, inhaled corticosteroids. And so, and it's, it's basically the only biologic 
that's been approved for neutrophilic asthma. So it's it's quite impressive. It's it it was a nice ride for me. Um, though I had absolutely nothing to do with the the development of of, of the drug. It's just very nice to be at the very beginning when I was at Immunex in the '90s and was part of the group that cloned both TSOP and the TSP receptor, and then to follow it. 20 years later when it gets approved as a drug um, and actually helps people. That was kind of a, a really nice ride. But what I'm going to talk to you about today are, is our two different roles for, for TSOP. The first one having to do with the, with the production of IgE. And this comes from a couple of observations, one that we made several years ago, showing that mice that lack TSLP signaling, so they're, they're knocked out for either the receptor or the cytokine itself, have dramatically reduced levels of circulating I, IgE to where it's barely detectable. Uh, and this suggested to us that, you know, we thought at the time with the, the connection of TSOP to type 2 inflammation that, that this was simply a matter of, you know, you're, you're dampening overall type 2 responses. And so since most type 2 responses end up producing IgE, that's the, that's the issue that, that, um, that explains this data. What we found from the Navigator trial, the trial that I just showed you before, and a couple of other trials that have used TSOP blockade in, in humans, we also see a, a, a rapid and continuing loss of serum IgE in patients who are on TSOP. And in another trial that I don't show you, it's called catnip, um, those patients had still had vanishingly low levels of serum IgE 12 months after they stopped treatment. And so the, the TSOP blockade was actually doing something durable to the IgE response in, in those people. And we think it might be a way of, of sort of, of rewiring the, those responses. And we think we might know why, and I'll go over that data right now. So the first story I'm gonna to talk to you about is uh, the role of, of, of TSOP in germinal center responses. This is all, every experiment that I'm gonna show you was done by Phil Domiea, very talented postdoc, now staff scientist in the lab. And this is the paper that just came out at, at the beginning of, of this year in science immunology. And it basically derives from a simple observation that Phil made when he first joined the lab. So Phil trained with Zia Rockman at Penn State Hershey Medical Center, studying germ, uh, germinal center responses and transcription factors and, and cytokines that sort of regulated those responses. And when he came to my lab, he was sort of pitching around for you know what he wanted to do, and we happened to have some TSOP knockout mice uh, uh, that no one was doing experiments on. So he took those mice and looked for homeostatic germinal centers in them, and these are germinal centers that are formed in mice and in humans in the absence of any overt inflammation or or um, vaccination, and they're thought to be responses to cell proteins, to endogenous viruses, et, et cetera, and patients with autoimmune disease have elevated numbers of them. And, and so it's a fairly straightforward experiment for Phil. And what he found quite interestingly is that um, unlike the, the control mice at the top panel here uh, that had very nice germinal centers, you could see the, the, the B cell follicles surrounding the, the um, germinal center. The, the spontaneous germinal centers in the TSOP knockout mice were really small, sort of vestigial, and it's quantified on the right where both the frequency and the number and the size of, of these, these spontaneous germinal centers were dramatically reduced in TSOP knockout mice. And the same was true for the receptor knockouts. And so we figured it, it was interesting. And, you know, based on this data, we, we wanted to ask a couple simple questions, which was what cells in the germinal center express the, the TSOP receptor so we could get a handle on, on who's responding and who isn't. And so we looked at, at uh, TFH cells and, and, and this is looking at PD-1 by CXCR5 and this group five right here are referred to as GCTFH. So they'll, those are the TFH that are actually functional in the germinal center and they have by far and away the highest expression of the TSOP receptor and also the IL-7 receptor than, um, than other um, uh, T cell effector subsets. Likewise, on, on the B cell side, we saw that GCB cells have the highest level of, of, of expression compared to um, 
circulating uh, uh, mature B cells. And to our surprise, what we found was when we looked more carefully at the levels of expression, this is a TSOP receptor, MFI and, and CD127 or the IL-7 receptor alpha chain, that the level of the TSOP receptor seemed to cycle between the light zone of the germinal center and the dark zone. So the light zone is, is, is where uh, B cell selection occurs, where TFH uh, select um, B cells that have the highest affinity uh, BCRs. The, the dark zone is, is, is where those B cells cycle through and, and uh, proliferate and undergo um, somatic hypermutation. And the, the TSLP receptor is highest in the, and the, 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 the two components of the receptor are highest in light zone cells and almost off in dark zone. We don't un understand what, what controls this, this pattern of expression. We're trying to look at that now, but it does suggest that there's something special ab about TSOP signaling in the light zone. And but I'm not going to tell you guess, for, for the sake of time, we have found that the source of TSLP in the germinal center are the um, follicular dendritic cells, which are a fibroblastic reticular cell type that's in the light zone. So it makes sense that they make TSLP, the TFH and the, and the um, GCB cells in the light zone are, are responding to that TSLP. But interestingly, when we look further, the highest level of expression that we see of these two chains are in plasma cells. Um, so cells that leave, we don't know yet what the function of TSLP signaling is in plasma cells themselves. But as I'll show you later, we think that TSLP signaling is an important factor in the decision that the GCB cells make to become either a plasma cell or, or a memory cell. And so these are the, the sort of simplified questions we wanted to ask. We knew that both of these populations have functional TSLP receptors. And we, as, as I mentioned, we know FDCs make the cytokine. So the question is, what happens? What does it do? And so we, we took a global approach at first, which was to take uh, e either, uh, in this case, uh, receptor uh, TSP receptor deficient mice and look at, see what happens and to, to the numbers. And what we found was that in both cytokine knockouts and the TSP receptor knockouts, the numbers of TFH plummet um, five or so fold and as do the numbers of GCB cells. And so the lack of TSLP signaling results in a small germinal center, fewer TFH, fewer GCB cells. So what happens, you know, can these mice make, make any kind of a response? This is the general um, experimental approach that I'll be using for, that Phil used for all these studies, which is basically take a B6 mouse, either wild type knockout, various knockouts, um, immunize with NP coupled to ovalbumin in uh, complex to alum, 10 or 14 days later, collect, sacrifice the mice and, and, and examine um, antibody responses. And the nice thing about NP is you can look at antigen specific responses very straightforwardly, both high affinity and, and low affinity. And this is looking at TSP receptor deficient animals. And you can see that the number of antigen specific cells, so NP30, um, is, is, a, is, a, is a reagent we can use to, to specifically I, I identify B cells that have BCRs that are um, specific for NP. And you can see that, that there's a dramatic drop in the number of either both total GCB cells and NP specific um, GCB cells. And it, this carries over in, in, into the, the uh, periphery where we looked at antibody forming cells in the spleen that are IgE, um, NP specific IgE, and both high affinity and low affinity cells are dramatically reduced. And so this suggests that in order to make a competent immune response, antibody response to um, immunization, you need TSLP signaling somewhere, either in the T cells or in the B cells. And since both express it, we wanted to ask who's more important. And of course, since I was I was raised as a T cell biologist. I really wanted to believe that it was the T cells that were important. Um, and so we, so we looked at those first. And because we know from work from my lab, but mostly work from Warren Leonard's lab at the NIH, that TSLP is important for uh, T cell development. Um, and so we, you know, we didn't want to have that confounding factor in our studies. 
And so we used mice that had a uh, tamoxifen inducible CD4 Cre to knock out the TSP receptor specifically in CD4 T cells. So basically the mice were given tamoxifen on, on um, three days prior to immunization. They were immunized and mice were collected um, 10 or 14 days later. And what we found was that the T cell specific deletion of the TSLP receptor recapitulated the global whole body um, knockout where we had reduced numbers of TFH, reduced numbers of GCB cells and reduced numbers of, of antigen specific GCB cells. And the B cell side, side of this makes sense because it's been shown for quite some time now by Shane Crotty and a, a number of other people that in the absence of TFH, you don't form germinal centers. And so we think that the, the main um, mechanism for the phenotype seen in the global knockouts is the knockout in the T cell compartment where you, can't, you don't form TFH and therefore you can't form a functional germinal center. Um, but we wanted to ask, since we knew that the GCB cells had the receptor, we wanted to ask whether there's a you know, specific function for, for TSLP signaling in germinal center B cells. And so we, we took an approach, again, trying to find a, a Cree deleter line that would only hit uh, mature B cells, because again, we and, and a few other groups have shown that TSLP signaling is very important in B cell development, that hardy fraction C cells in the bone marrow require a TSLP signal to go on to develop into um, mature B cells. And, and so we, we picked two. One is CD21 Cre, which is expressed in uh, all, all mature B cells, and so knocks it out prior to the cells entering the germinal center. We can, and all the data that I'm going to show you is with the CD1 Cre line. We also used AID Cre, which is expressed primarily in GCB cells, and we confirmed all of the data we got with CD21 Cre with AID Cre. So what we see with this strain, we also see with that strain. So for the sake of time, I'm only going to show the, the CD21 data. And so when we did that, much to our surprise, this is day 14, instead of seeing a, a reduction in, in the number of GCB cells and antigen-specific B cells, we saw an increase. And it, it was a quite substantial increase uh, compared to the two control lines, which are either the Flox line or the the, the Cree line by itself. And this was quite surprising to us and we were a little befuddled by it. And when we looked more carefully at light zone B cells, all the increase was seen within the light zone, suggesting again, since that's where the, the highest level of the receptor is expressed, that something is going on in the light zone that um, the lack of TSOP signaling increased the number of cells that were in the light zone compartment. And when, we, and when Phil looked uh, histologically at at this, at the germinal centers in these mice, the two control lines had normal numbers of, of germinal centers. These are antigen-specific cells that are dispersed throughout the germinal center in the controls. In the CD21 Cre TSP receptor flox animals, the light zone area here is where all of the antigen-specific cells are piling up. It's like they get in, they can't get out. Um, this is shown here with the, the number of GCs are actually increased in these animals. Um, their size, as you can see between these pictures, is, 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 is much larger. And the number of antigen-specific B cells in each GC is also uh, quite significantly increased. And it suggests that in the absence of getting a TSOP signal when they're being selected, they don't know what to do and they, and they, just, they just stay in the, in, in the germinal center. And so we know that um, part of this is due to the, to, a, a transcription factor called IRF4, which we know in, in, the, in TFH is required for the, the differentiation of, of effector cells into TFH. And in the B cell compartment, it controls this decision between becoming a plasma cell and a memory cell because IRF4 expression is, is uh, directly proportional to BCR signal strength. And so the highest BCR signal strength the highest number, the level of, of IRF4, and that drives BLIMP1 e expression, which blocks BCL6 and drives plasma cell differentiation. Uh, medium affinity BCRs give a, a 
a median level of IR4 e expression, and those cells tend to become memory. And so what we see in the um, GCB cells for IR4, there seems to be a dose-dependent effect of TSLP receptor on IR4 levels. So wild-type mice have high levels, TSLP receptor knockout um, heterozygote mice have intermediate levels of IR4, and the whole knockout has quite dramatic, uh, about 50% of the, of, of the wild-type level of IR4. And this is seen primarily in light zone B cells. So the, the effect of TSOP, um, uh, lack of TSOP signaling, uh, again, is, is, is reflected in the level of IRF4 seen in um, light zone B cells. And uh, consistent with this observation, we see an increase in the number of, of memory B cells. Uh, and these cells are, are accumulating in the germinal center. And we, we think this is really relevant because we would predict, and we're, we're, we're testing that right now, that these memory cells, unlike what would be going on in the wild-type mice, these cells are very likely to have very high affinity B cell receptors because they're being selected um, normally by uh, TFH, but because they can only make uh, minimal levels of IRF4, they, they don't make enough IRF4 to be uh, differentiating into plasma cells, but they have high affinity receptors and they're becoming memory. So this could have some consequences. You could think about this as a, as a way to generate really good memory in a, in a vaccine uh, uh, protocol. And, and we're, we're starting to look at that right now. So what we think is going on in this is that in the TFA side of things, TSOP signaling is driving IRF4, and, and this allows TFH to be generated and germinal centers to form. On the B cell side, again, it's through, we think it's largely through IRF4, and that TSOP in the normal setting is increasing the level of IRF4. And I didn't see this. If you just take B cells, um, splenic B cells, and culture them in, in the presence of, of TSOP, IRF4 levels increase. And so we think that this, I, this TSOP signaling is important to maintain and increase IRF4 levels in, in the cells to drive the, the production of, of, of plasma cells. And this also has consequences for um, uh, vaccine development, because you could think about adding TSLP or an RNA encoding TSLP to an RNA vaccine and increasing the number of, of plasma cells for an acute response. And so, uh, we're, we're now trying to understand um, whether TSOP also plays a role in the function of memory and, and, and plasma cells during recall responses, and we're building models to try to test that now. And we're also using the, the approach that Mark Davis's lab used to make tonsil organoids from humans, and uh, they form germinal centers in culture, and we, we have data showing that if you add TSOP to that, during a, a quote unquote vaccination of, of, of those cultures, you get increased antigen specific plasma blasts out the other end. And so we now think we have a, a human system where we can start to look at the, the role of, of, of TSLP in, in antibody responses. And so that's the end of chapter one. And for the, the Monty Python fi fans out there, um, and now for something completely different, um, the, the second vignette that I want to tell you about, I was extremely happy about um, for a philosophical reason, which is that, as Tron mentioned in the introduction, my lab studies both you know, TSLP and responses at barriers, but also FOXP3 and, and uh, regulatory T cells. And so this is a, a set of experiments um, that was done by this very talented postdoc, Kaz Abada Ninamaya. In, um, in my lab, where we've managed to combine the two halves of the lab into one project. So we have TSOP responsive Tregs that play a, a critical role in um, the, the progression of, of colorectal cancer. And I'm gonna go over that data now. <clears throat> and uh, it's, it's quite exciting and has definite implications for um, treatment of, of, of patients with colorectal cancer. So. It's colorectal cancer. It's the third most common cancer in, in, in men and women. Um, it's, it's 
you know, one or two percent of the population, and still, all these years later, about a third a third of the patients will die. Um, it's there's there is a, a an association of colon cancer with um, inflammatory bowel disease. So there there is an inflammatory component that um, contributes to the development of of disease, and importantly. Um, immune checkpoint inhibitors really don't work. There's about 5% of the pop of the patients with these tumors respond. And, and these are, these are the um, patients uh, that have uh, the unstable mutations, but that's only about 5% of patients. The other 95%, they don't respond to e either anti-PD-1 or anti-CTLA-4. So we wanted to try to understand what's going on in this disease. And so this is, this is uh, work that, that caused it initially, which is looking at one of six different um, data sets that, that he looked at that are just basically sequences of colon cancers in a wide variety of patients and in segregating those um, patients into ar arbitrarily those that express the high level of TSLP and those that express the low level. And what you can see here, is that in, in the red, if you expressed, if you fell into the high TSOP category, you had a much worse prognosis than those patients that fell in, in, into the low category. And so that suggested that there was a, a role somehow for, for TSOP in, in the um, progression of, of colorectal cancer. And just looking at expression levels through stages of, of, of this cancer, um, there's the same level of expression regardless of, of what the stage is, which suggests that it's, it's involved throughout the course of, of, the, of the disease. And so we, we set up an animal model. Well, we used an animal model that had been established quite, quite a few years ago, which is basically to take uh, in, in, in either B6 or BALBC mice, this is a B6 protocol. For BALBC, you only do two rounds of DSS. Um, Basically, they're given a, a genotoxic agent, um, azoxymethane, for our experiments. And then starting one week later, they go through cycles of one week of 1% of DSS in their water, um, two weeks of, of regular water, and then another cycle of DSS in water, et cetera. And then by nine or 10 weeks, we sack the mice and, and examine their tumors. And this is done for, for this example in mice that are wild type and are TSOP receptor deficient. And what you can see is in the in the wild type mice, you get you know this nice array of, of, of tumors forming in the colon. They're they're more in the in, in the distal end and sort of decrease as 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 you get more proximal. In the TSP receptor deficient mice, there's not there's both fewer numbers of tumors, about half as many um, depending on the experiment. But also, each tumor it, itself, on average, is smaller than what one sees in the in the wild type mice. And this obviously suggested that TSOP signaling was playing a role. <clears throat> this was a whole body knockout, so we really couldn't say for sure um, what cells were were um, responding to to TSOP in this setting. I will tell you, without showing showing you the data, that we we do know that. The epithelium itself, the, 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 the cells that form the tumors, do have the TSP receptor on their surface. And if you knock out the receptor specifically in the epithelium, you do see a reduction in tumors. And that's similar to what we saw in breast cancer, where we think in, in these settings, uh, TSOP acts as a survival factor for the tumor by regulating the expression of BCL2 and BCLXL. So that's pretty straightforward. It's not really very exciting, but it is important. But we, but Kaz found a, a, a very different role for, for TSOP in this tumor. And that's what I want to focus on for the rest of the talk, which are these T-rays that he found. So he, and, and, you know, initially with the same bias that I have about T-cells, um, examined all of the T-cell populations within the tumors to try to see who had levels of, of TSOP receptor. It, the expression and 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 essentially only the T-Rex, which was very surprising to us, um, in these tumors had increased levels of of uh, TSOP receptor expression. And not only that, but these these 
um, T regs in the tumors also had elevated levels of um, ST2, which is the receptor for IL-33. So these are T regs now that can respond to, to two different cytokines that are expressed at the epithelial barrier, TSLP and IL-33. And um, as, as, as you'll see, this is a very unique subset of uh, regulatory T cells. And so when we looked at, we did a lot of, of gene expression analysis, and you know this is just one of those experiments, and I wanted to point this out, where the purple set here are the double positive or the TSLP receptor ST2 uh, positive Tregs. They have the highest level of, of expression of genes that encode proteins that are important for Treg function. So PD1, TIGIT, KLRG1, ICOS, CTLA4, Helios, the highest level of expression are in these cells, um, suggesting that they have very, they're very functional. And, and I can tell you that within these four populations, which are the double negative, the SC2 single positive, T, TSP receptor single positive, and these double positive cells, these cells, the purple guys, have the highest um, ability to suppress um, affected T cells than, than the other subsets. And they, they, they actually respond to TSLP to become more suppressive. And so we want to say, well, what happens if, if we get rid of the TSLP receptor? Because there's not a lot of literature on TSLP signaling in um, regulatory T cells. And so we used a, a FOXP3 Cre to delete. And much to our pleasure, we saw, again, a fairly dramatic reduction in the number of tumors in these mice. And again, the tumors that were there were, were significantly smaller. And what was really interesting to us is that when Kaz looked at other T cell subsets within the tumors, he found that the mice that had that lacked the TSOP receptor on their Tregs had increased numbers of, of, of Th1 affected T cells in their tumors, whereas the CD8 cells were, were unaffected. And we know from other studies that it's the IL-33 signaling in these Tregs that regulates CD8 levels. And so what we think these Tregs are, are basically doing is is blocking the two arms of T cell mediated anti tumor immunity, uh, TSP signaling taking out um, TH1s and IL 33 signaling taking out CD8s. <clears throat> and I, I, I won't get into this, but you can see that in the paper, we know some of, of this functionality of TSP signaling in these cells is due to the ability of that pathway to upregulate a transcription factor called MEF2C which then upregulates CTLA-4. And so we, we think that's at least part of, of the TSOP circuitry that, um, that regulates these, these uh, Tregs in, in tumors. Now, we, we wanted to ask whether the ST, you know, knocking out ST2 would, would be relevant here. And to our surprise, at least in our hands, in our colony, we really didn't see much of an effect of just knocking out IL-33 signaling in these Tregs. But when we made the double knockout, so we not we made Tregs that were that could not respond to either cytokine, we did see in a synergistic effect where again we saw a further decrease in tumors and, a, and they were even smaller than the ones seen in the TSP receptor deficient Treg uh, bearing mice. <clears throat> and so we are. We are now busily, well, we meaning cause, are uh, generating reagents that, that we can use to um, simultaneously block um, TSOP receptor and, and ST2 on, 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 on these Tregs to see their effect on, um, on, on tumor development. And to that notion, we wanted to ask whether, you know, every experiment we've done was uh, genetic. We use knockouts and obviously, um, if you're going to treat someone with colon cancer, you're not going to do it with, you know, knocking out genes and things like that. You're going to do it with, with antibody blockade. <clears throat> and you're going to do it in patients where, who are, who have already presented with, with tumors be, before they're treated. And so Kaz set up a, a model where he did the first round of AOM and, and DSS. And we know from other people's work that this starts tumor progression. So these mice already have, um, small tumors, and then started treating with either an anti-TSOP antibody or an anti-TSOP receptor antibody to ask in a, in, a, in a therapeutic mode, can we 
um, in, in inhibit tumor progression, and we can. This is the data for anti-TSLP. This is the data for anti-TSLP receptor. And they're basically, the, we, we see the same thing regardless, where like we saw in the T-Rex specific knockouts, fewer tumors that are smaller, increased levels of T effector cells that, that are TH1s for both of these. So that suggests, again, that we can actively inhibit tumor progression once it's begun, um, at least in mice. And so now the, the obvious question is, what about humans? You know, it's really nice to have all, all this, you know, lovely data in mice, but, you know, can we block, um, you know, do we see the same things in, in, in people? And in fact, we do. So uh, this is looking at a single patient where we are able to get both tumor tissue and um, adjacent normal colon. And we only see this subset of Tregs in the tumor, not in normal colon. And this is seen across, we're now up to, I think, 10 patients. Um, but we only see this increase in um, normal colon to tumor of the TSP receptor SC2 double positive Tregs. Um, the other subsets are, are really um, not, not significant. And to, to look at this more carefully, we collaborated with Susan Bullman at the Fred Hutchinson doing single cell analysis. And this is looking at uh, the tumor. We have a similar um, uh, UMAP for, for normal colon. And we know that this box here contains CD4 T cells and this little tip at the end here are where the T regs are. And if we look at those cells and ask who expresses FOXP3, CRLF2, which is the human gene that encodes the TSFP receptor, or IL-1 receptor L1, which is the gene that encodes ST2, we see that the Tregs are in both, but only the Tregs and the tumors co-express the TSOP receptor and ST2 or the IL-33 receptor. And so this is consistent with what we've seen. We've looked at lots of patients now, and we only see these cells in tumors, not in IBD patients, not in normal colon. And we also don't see them in other tumors that we know are TSLP responsive. So this seems to be something special in the colon that we don't really un, um, understand yet. <clears throat> Interestingly, we also see these cells in the peripheral blood of patients, which is kind of strange. And, and we don't know whether there's a precursor product relationship between the Tregs in the blood and the Tregs in the uh, tumor. We're now doing uh, TCR sequencing to see if, if they are um, the same cells, but we only see these cells elevated in the, in the blood of, of patients. And, you know, this is looking at, you know, an N of 20 and it's, it's, it's increased now. But interestingly, again, we don't see it in other tumors that we know are TSOP responsive. So pancreatic cancer, breast cancer, lung cancer, we don't see these SC2 positive, um, TSOP receptor positive Tregs in their blood. We don't see them in the tumors either. Um, and so that suggests that we can use the presence of these regulatory T cells in the blood as a biomarker potentially for the presence of uh, colon cancer. And we're now testing this in two ways. One way is to screen patients that have had their tumors resected and ask whether these cells in the blood go away. And that, that would be a, a way to monitor responses to patients to, to surgery without having to un, undergo colonoscopy. And we're also taking blood from individuals who have a, a suspicious um, screening colonoscopy. So they have a large adenoma or something that would, would require them to come in one year later to get a, a second scope. And we're asking whether those patients have these uh, TSLP receptor positive, SC2 positive Tregs in their blood, again, as a, as a biomarker for potential advancement to uh, frank cancer. And so this is our model. What we think is going on is we know the tumor can make TSLP. We're not exactly certain where the IL-33 comes from. There's some data out there su su suggesting that um, fibroblast populations that are associated with the epithelium express IL-33, and very recent data from COS uh, about a month ago or less suggests that neutrophils that infiltrate these tumors also can make TSLP. 
And so we're now trying to, to track that down. But we think this, these two cytokines control these Tregs, which are <clears throat> um, found only in the tumors. And they together signal through, through these Tregs to block the effector cells that are um, responsible for anti-tumor immunity. And so they're, they're, they're basically providing a pro-tumor uh, microenvironment um, to support tumor growth. And with that, I will close. Um, lots of acknowledgments to go around my, in my lab. This was the, the colon cancer work was, was initially started by a former postdoc, Stephen De Jesus Carrion, and it was carried on by Kaz. Um, we've had collaboration from James Lord, who is a, a gastroenterologist in our, in our building and, and has been very important in our analysis of, of the, the human tumors. We had take advantage of all, all of the cores at um, BRI, uh, the, the genomics core, which had all the sequencing, and Alex Hugh, who was in the bioinformatics group, um, did all of the analysis uh, for both projects, actually. Um, the, the vivarium, we have a, a cell and tissue analysis core that we did use for flow cytometry. We used the, the these last two are critically important. Whoa, what happened? Sorry, sorry about that. Um, uh, the clinical core laboratory, which which processes and and takes care of all all of the the human patient samples for us, so we don't have to do it ourselves. And the Bright program, which is our our tumor uh, repository program that Meg Ma that Meg Mandelson handles. And without both of these, we we wouldn't have been able been able to do all the human work that I just described. And of course, we're very um, appreciative of the patients and the healthy donors that have contributed to this work, our funding and institute. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you.